I am David A. Bradbury, and this is 20 Minute History. On today's episode, as you're no doubt aware, this season dabbles not only in historically unfamiliar men and women, but also in those whose memories have been tarnished, mystified, poisoned, if you will. And few men fit this category better than Grigory Efimovich Rasputin. This is Season 1, Episode 7, and let's jump right in. The Yusupov Palace in St. Petersburg belongs to a series of other 18th century royal residences lining the Moika River. It is, in this host's humble opinion, comparatively unassuming when viewed from the front. Though strikingly large, it has very few adornments besides a row of columns and a decorative trim. However, these shortcomings of the exterior quickly fade when guests enter the castle to find accommodations fit for a prince. A private theater, expansive royal red dining rooms, extravagantly decorated bathrooms, and golden chandeliers, among other things. But perhaps the most captivating aspect of this centuries-old building is one that cannot be seen by the naked eye. Without a background knowledge in recent Russian history, one might miss the fact that this very palace played host to one of the most infamous murders of all time. Late night, in the bitingly cold Russian winter of 1916, supposedly a group of royalists intent on saving the Russian monarchy set out to kill the mystical Siberian peasant that had been destroying it. They managed to lead him inside under the guise that he would be their dinner guest that evening, then proceeding to serve him sweet cakes and wine that were both laced with fatal doses of cyanide. Unbelievably, the poison failed to produce the intended effect, so an impatient assassin pulled out a revolver and shot him in the chest. This, too, did not quite do the trick. After a few minutes of lying unconscious on the floor, the miracle worker jolted upright and made a dash for the front door. Shocked, the killers chased after him and shot him twice more, once in the back and once in the forehead, landing him face down in the snow. His arms and legs were bound with rope, and his limp remains were finally cast into the frozen river. When the body was excavated from its icy grasp the next morning, an autopsy was performed which allegedly determined the cause of death? Drowning. You've probably heard this story before. You're also probably at least passingly familiar with the story of the rest of Rasputin's life, and if you're like me, you instinctively find most of the things you hear about him to be highly unbelievable. But allow me to assure you, a lot of it is more accurate than you might think. Now make no mistake, Rasputin is certainly the subject of a great deal of historical myth-making, and just like in our episode on Joseph Smith, I'm definitely not about to let any mystical or supernatural claims go unchallenged. But beyond that, I would propose to you that Rasputin truly was one of those once-in-a-millennium icons, a man for whom fact and fiction are so difficult to discern in part because his actions so often seem to defy rational explanation. Today, we find ourselves dealing with a man who was in some ways both healer and abuser, teacher and student, monarch and subject, holy man, and heathen. Given all these contradictions, is it any wonder so many people don't know what to believe? I think not. So please accept my imperfect attempt to provide some clarification. The circumstances of Rasputin's birth in the small Siberian village of Pokrovskoy could only be made remarkable when viewed in the context of the rest of his life. For as truly fascinating as it may be to watch a man climb from the lowest rung of society to the peak of political influence, that clearly doesn't change the fact that when Grigori came into being on January 9th, 1869, he was little more than another insignificant Russian peasant, 
His family subsisted primarily on hunting, fishing, and farming, and though it's possible that their lives were more comfortable than their neighbors, his father Yefim's plot of land and collection of a few dozen livestock could hardly be called a small fortune. In his formative years, Grigori received no formal education, shocker, I know, and what schooling he did receive came from the Orthodox Church. And there wasn't a whole lot more to his adolescent routine than that. If it sounds to you more like I'm describing 16th century British serfs and not an actual family living in the latter half of the 19th century, your observation would be rather apt. You see, at this point in history, the Russian economy suffered from criminal underdevelopment, and while the rest of Europe benefited from the Second Industrial Revolution beginning around 1880, Russia was still desperately clinging to the same rural system it had held on to for centuries. In fairness, there was a slight trend toward urbanization and industrialization during this time, but it was heavily centralized in just St. Petersburg and Moscow, and as such only affected around one-fifth of the population. This small minority of the populace living in city centers then began earning greater capital, granting them a shot at limited upward social mobility, while the 80% of Russians classified as the peasantry depended almost entirely on the land and had almost no way to escape their station in life. This likely contributed to the development of vast differences in worldview between city folk and country folk, whereas the former largely thought they had at least some control over their own destiny, the latter felt that their only choice was to accept fate. It is no surprise then that from the beginning Rasputin was consumed with the orthodox idea that faith and submission to the will of God would themselves lead him down the right path. So engrossed was he that he took several solo pilgrimages throughout his teens and twenties, hoping that this might strengthen his connection to God, as well as correct some of his most egregious transgressions. What were those transgressions, you might ask? Well, first of all, Rasputin loved alcohol. A lot. He never seemed to go a night without it, and he found himself in a number of less-than-ideal situations while under its influence. His intoxicated activities ranged from verbal harassment and petty horse thievery to sexual assault and rape. Unacceptable behaviors in need of immediate correction. Too bad these ventures did absolutely nothing to correct them, and at times even seemed to bring them out in full force. This from Joseph T. Furman, quote, Although Rasputin was married, he pursued other women. Sometimes he would ask a woman to undress and wash him so that they might resist temptation together. Rasputin had an unusually strong sex drive, and it affected every aspect of his life. End quote. It seems that Grigori never considered sexual proclivity and misconduct seriously sinful. Or if he did, then he never made a concerted effort to change that behavior. As a matter of fact, the only change his journeys did seem to affect was in convincing himself, and some others, that he had broad religious powers. The highest leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church never really took a liking to Rasputin, but by 1902, his outgoing character, religious passion, and gutsy opinions attracted a sizable following. Conversations about him frequently invoke the term starets, a term with a few different definitions depending on who you asked, but which was generally intended to indicate a powerful religious leader with mystical healing powers. This kind of noise inevitably commanded the attention of even a few established holy men, most crucial among them, Theophon of Poltava, an elite archbishop whose most firmly held conviction was that God was present in the hearts of even the most ordinary men and women. Upon meeting Rasputin, he was so taken by the Siberian's theological perspective and strength that he felt there was no better choice than to introduce him to his most powerful friend, Nicholas II. The last Tsar and his wife Alexandra first met Rasputin in 1905, and initially it seemed as though the royal couple saw in him many of the same attributes that Theophon did, which is to say they valued him as a spiritual voice and as a representative of the common people. But within a year, Rasputin had earned a regular place within the Tsar's palace for another reason entirely. And no, it wasn't because he was engaged in a sexual relationship with the Tsarina, 
Rather, evidence that has recently come to light leads us to believe that Nicholas and Alexandra sought Rasputin's continued presence as a healer. One need only understand that the monarchy's rules of succession prohibited a woman from leading the country to realize that the health and well-being of the Tsar's only son, Alexis, was of paramount importance. It is only natural, then, that the couple would worry for the future of their family's reign when Alexis was diagnosed with hemophilia, a genetic disorder that inhibits blood clotting and makes even the most minor cuts and bruises life-threatening. Nicholas and Alexandra did not have to imagine how close this would bring their son to death. They watched it happen with shocking regularity. And then, just a year or two after this fateful news struck, this Siberian mystic waltzed onto the scene. It just so happened that whenever the prince suffered a bad bout of hemophilia, Rasputin was called upon to pray over him, and the symptoms would subside over the next few days, no matter how dire Alexis's situation may have looked. For ten years, these seemingly miraculous powers alone kept him in good favor with the royal family. And when I say alone, I mean alone. Because at no point did Rasputin's behavior change significantly from the days of his religious wanderings. He still drank, still went on wild sexual escapades, and still publicly conducted himself in embarrassing ways, including one occasion on which he exposed himself to a crowded restaurant. <gasps> The Tsar and Tsarina, rather than being oblivious, sometimes bore personal witness to these actions, and though it may have taken every ounce of strength they had to ignore it, in the end, they did. Because it didn't matter to them how much shame he brought to the Romanov name, nor did it matter how many skeptics attempted to discredit his supposed powers. What mattered was the health of their chronically sick son, and in that regard, they watched Rasputin deliver time and time again. In their minds, they simply had no choice but to keep him around. With this, Rasputin's presence in the royal court was firmly cemented, and it wasn't long before the miracle man started exerting his influence over the Tsar. It started with a fairly innocuous request to legally change his surname, probably in an attempt to distance himself from his peasant lineage, but from there it moved to recommending personal allies for political and religious positions. Some of these appointments succeeded, such as that of the Bishop Varnava, but to his credit, Nicholas blocked most of them. Alexandra, over whom Rasputin arguably had greater influence, could protest as much as she wanted, but so long as nothing interrupted Nicholas's ultimate control over the government, Rasputin's power could be held in check. Unfortunately for the autocrat and his subjects, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand provided just that sort of interruption. The beginning of the First World War immediately set off urgent alarm bells in Russia's government and military. Their delayed industrial boom along with the inherent geographical complications of mobilizing the Tsar's army spelled certain catastrophe unless Nicholas acted fast. Left with few other options, the Tsar transported himself to the front lines, leaving control of the state in his wife's hands. Rasputin had found his golden opportunity. Left and right, government officials were being replaced, and not surprisingly, since their primary qualification was an alliance with Rasputin, the new guard was slow, ineffective, corrupt. Their misdeeds rapidly undermined trust in the government, and soon thereafter there were rumblings of unrest amongst the citizenry. An uprising seemed imminent. The fate of the government rested in the hands of just a few men who were willing to take drastic action, and with an appreciation for their impact on the course of history, they decided it was time to kill Rasputin. From that point, well, you know the details. And I do feel it's my responsibility to tell you that though the popular legend is largely true, we can also dispel many mystical claims about it fairly easily. First. Rasputin didn't drown. There is no autopsy report that makes that assertion. Every report we do have agrees that the gunshot to his forehead caused immediate death. Second, strange though it may seem, some scientists have speculated that a certain chemical reaction may have rendered the cyanide in his food non-lethal if it was even there to begin with. And the gunshot to his chest? I don't know, man. Sometimes bullets just kind of miss the important stuff. 
point is, there was nothing necessarily supernatural about the night of his death. And that's that, right? The, the myths are corrected. We don't need to point to mysterious powers to explain any part of Rasputin's life. End of story, right? Well, no, not exactly. Because I also feel that wrapping things up there would leave one last nagging question unanswered. How in God's name did the epic Rasputin mythos ever get to be so epic in the first place? Of course, there really is no easy answer. For the Russians living through it, I have a feeling rumors got out of hand in an attempt to rationalize how a mere peasant could have so much control over the royal regime. At the time, Alexis's illness was a closely guarded secret, so Rasputin's central role in the palace was obscured. Amongst the populace, there was also a brewing national discontentment with autocracy generally and with this leadership specifically. When Sir George Buchanan asked the Tsar if he would try to win his people back to his side, Nicholas II famously scoffed, Do you mean that I am to regain the confidence of my people, or that they are to regain my confidence? an attitude which was not lost on the average Russian. All of this could only naturally lead to speculation that the peasant enjoyed a scandalous affair with the Tsarina and the Tsar was either too sheepish or too indifferent to keep it from ruining the country. Gossip and stories about Rasputin were then spun to cast him in a nasty, demonic light and the line between fact and fiction was officially blurred. But what about for the rest of us who didn't live through it? Well, for one, it is certainly likely that Soviet secrecy left us with a lack of credible information regarding Rasputin, but more than that, I'd simply posit that there's something undeniably, fantastically intriguing about a horrible, bumbling mystic that upset the rule of an entire country, seduced the Tsarina, and gave a defiant middle finger to death itself. To me, that seems so obviously the case that I think neither I nor the rest of the historical community will ever be able to make widespread and meaningful corrections to this myth. It's just too impossibly entertaining. It hits all the right weak points in our collective logical faculties, and as a result, most people just want to believe it. I will always take a stupid amount of joy in scouring history for verifiable knowledge and data, but whether I like it or not, the myth of Grigory Rasputin will likely always take after the man himself. It will be extremely difficult to kill. Thank you all so much for listening to another episode of 20 Minute History. As always, if you liked it, then please consider subscribing, leaving a rating, and checking us out on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 20minhistory. And again, a very special thanks to the brilliant minds without whose works I could not have written this episode, including Joseph T. Furman, Gian V. Cormina, Neil Faulkner, and R.J. Brocklehurst. And on next week's episode, please join me as we dive deep into a rescue mission viewed across the country. Until then, I've been David A. Bradbury, and please stay curious, keep reading, and never stop learning, lest you-know-what repeats itself. 